Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Have a, um, a, a very great Sunday. Um, welcome to our forum discussion. Today, we'll be talking about the misconception of HIV and AIDS. So today, we actually have um, panelists from the clinical aspect and also the social aspect to actually come together and give their input about HIV and AIDS. So before that, let me introduce myself. I am a third year medical student um, from Masa University, and I'm currently the secretary of Masa Medical Society 2019-2020. Besides that, I am actually an advocate for sexual and reproductive health and rights. I am also the local officer for standing committee of sexual and reproductive health and rights, including HIV and AIDS under IFMSA, or more commonly known, International Federation of Medical Student Association. So, um, <clears throat> I'll just briefly tell everybody about our panelists here, and later I'll invite them to tell um, more about themselves. So we have Dr. Saad Alassi, sorry, Alassil, please excuse me if I have pronounced the name wrongly. Um, he is a clinical microbiologist, he's a head of Student Central, and also a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Medicine, Bioscience, and the Nursing in Masa University. We also have panelists from Kuala Lumpur AIDS Support Services, or CLASS, we have Mr. Hafiz Samizi Nur Azizi and Mr. Muhammad Kairu Pake Oshman. They are both um, outreach workers with working with class, and I believe they can contribute um, in a lot of um, input in the social aspect on addressing misconception of HIV and AIDS. Um, without further ado, um, I'd like to invite Dr. Saad to introduce herself more. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me for this uh, exciting uh, event. Uh, I'm Dr. Saad, and uh, I'm a clinical microbiologist uh, by training, and what actually got me interested to participate uh, in this uh, forum is because uh, it is such an important topic that involves uh, everyone, basically, from healthcare workers to, uh, you know, the general public, there are many uh, misconceptions about this uh, disease uh, and we actually have uh, the obligation and the responsibility to raise awareness on that and, and for that uh, I am uh, here with all uh, the other uh, panelists so uh, thank you very much guys and uh, looking forward to uh, to discuss more. Thank you Dr. Da um, shall we have Mr. Hafiz um, and then we follow by Mr. Cairo. Hi everyone, thank you for having us today. Good morning, my name is Hafiz. So thank you Jonathan for inviting us and also thank you Dr. Saad for giving, sharing our opinions about today's topic which is misconception about HIV and AIDS. Yeah, so uh, I am Kairu, you guys can call me Kai. Thank you once again Jonathan and Dr. Saad and also Mahasa University. Uh, I'm really glad uh, that uh, we have this kind of platform to share our experience and our uh, thought on handling clients in our field as a social worker. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Saad. Um, thank you, Hafiz, and also Kai. So before we can, before we proceed with our discussion, I'd like to just tell the audience and um, let our panelists know why Massa Medical Society wants to organize this forum discussion. So we are a medical student body and our aim is always to you know, promote um, medical student activities and I believe HIV and AIDS awareness and you know, to addressing and debunking the myths. It's actually a very good um, engagement for our students with the public. And you know, as we are the future doctors and our future, I'm uh, sorry, we as a future doctors and uh, medical professionals, I believe this is what we should know, you know, without, it, it's not an option, it's something that we must know. So, so our purpose of organizing this is to educate Massa medical students about HIV and AIDS and the myths that goes around HIV and AIDS. We also want to enlighten Massa medical students about the impact of such discrimination against people living with HIV and AIDS by a medical professional or the future us if we do not engage with topics like this actively. And also 
to emphasize the importance of understanding our current healthcare system in tackling HIV transmission. So I'd like to invite, um, it can be Kai, it can be Hafiz to chip in why, or you know, tell us more about class. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Happy weekend. Yeah, Sunday. I'm happy. So we are very glad that you spent your weekend with to us with yeah. this session held by Massa University. So let's proceed about a brief background about class. class. So who and what we are. So class has been around, I think, since 2001. So we actually begin with a uh, shelter home in 1996. Then we'll establish an organization which is known as Kuala Lumpur and Support Service Society. So what we are doing is that we provide services in terms of HIV care, care treatment, um, and many other things that related with helping the community that is affected by the HIV itself. So currently we have been funded by Global Fund and also MOH. Yeah. So what we are doing. Yeah. So this is uh, the services currently that we are doing. As stated by Hafiz, we are funded by uh, Global Fund and also Ministry of Health. So for the Global Fund, we got a program called the HSKP. The HSKP is uh, for those who are key population. So we are have uh, outreach workers and case workers where we will deal with the clients via online dating apps and social media. Mm -hmm. We will give a health advocacy about uh, how to prevent HIV and what is HIV. So we will also be linking them to voluntary uh, counseling and testing at clinics and also community-based testing at facilities and GPOs. And we got also mobile testing. Uh, and then we're also giving out condoms, uh, we call it as a commodities, to our risky population. So can you explain more to our audience, what are the key population? Okay. So key population is the population of people who practice a high uh, risk behavior, such as MSM, men who have sex with men, uh, female sex worker, people who are injecting drugs, uh, and Trans then gender. transgender populations. So this is the group of key population that handle in DHS, DHSKP program. So we got another program uh, are funded by Ministry of Health, which is Treatment Adherence Peer Support. This is fully uh, helped by PLHIV peers itself. So it will help for those who are newly diagnosed and focusing more in hospital. For outreach worker and case worker, more in clinics, and uh, for PLHV peers, more in hospital. We call it as a TAPS. And another one, we got a uh, care center for PLHV, or we call it as class care, class center. care center. So this is temporary shelter for people living with HIV and located in uh, Taman Mastiara Jalan Ipu. Yeah. Ah, I see. All right, that that is very inclusive of um class, you know, to actually cover every aspect of you know addressing PLHIVs. I, I I hope you know that class will actually take things forward in the future. You know, make it make it a, a total new game. You know, really really step up the game to addressing <clears throat> the uh, HIVs and then how to first, and how to help people with people living with HIVs. So. Um, thank you, Hafiz and Kai. Um, before the, before we go into the discussion um, part of the sorry the discussion part of the forum, I'd like to invite Dr. Saad to give in some informative input about HIV and AIDS. Okay. So um, HIV, I mean, uh, it stands for uh, Human Immunodeficiency uh, Virus. It is the virus that actually causes AIDS, which stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Now, uh, many people, they, they uh, misunderstand that HIV actually um, equals to AIDS, but that's not the case. Uh, there are many people who are infected with HIV, but they don't have AIDS simply because they undergo a treatment, and the treatment, uh, it's been effective for uh, over uh, 20 years. Now, uh, at the virus itself, the human immunodeficiency uh, virus, 
Originally, actually, it was um, circulated among uh, chimpanzees and uh, animals usually back in Africa in, in the mid uh, 40s and 50s. And uh, due to um, behavior such as uh, exposure to, to these animals, eating these animals, the virus was transmitted from being an SIV, uh, seminal immunodeficiency virus, to an HIV. There was a species uh, jump, and from there, uh, the, the, the infection actually started to spread. The first case of HIV was detected in 1981 among homosexual men, and from there, it, it started to spread like a wildfire. It turns out that HIV was not only associated with homosexuals or not even with sexual activity, but rather uh, through blood or blood contaminated products. So what does the virus do is that it infects uh, basically um, specific types of immune cells called the CD4 T cells. And these cells are one of the most important uh, arsenal of our immune system to fight infections. And uh, in, in the first three to four weeks of the infection, the viral load starts to shoot. It becomes very high, detectable. And uh, then the virus starts to uh, slow down in its replication. Now, of course, with the, with the aid of treatment, the, the viral, uh, what we call the viral suppression, will be increased. However, uh, you can never get rid of the virus completely. And this is the, the tragedy of, of HIV. Um, then, after a period of 8 to 10 years, the virus will still replicate in a form what we call clinical latency and um, in that uh, the patient or the, the, the person who is infected actually looks perfectly normal. He or she will not will never know, especially if they, they haven't done the test, they will never know that they are actually infected but uh, they can transmit the virus into others. If there are no treatments furthermore after this 8 to 10 years then a range of opportunistic infections will start to appear from fungal infections, parasitic infections, and of course without treatment this will lead to death. So HIV can lead to AIDS and AIDS if it's untreated definitely uh, there's a high mortality rate for it. Now uh, the transmission for HIV, um, maybe we can do the second slide, uh, these are the three main uh, routes of transmission of HIV. Of course the most commonly known is uh, sexual activity. When we say sexual, uh, it is actually uh, homosexual or heterosexual. And it can be either anal, vaginal, or even oral. Now, the, the second most common uh, route of transmission is through um, needles. I mean, in injecting drug users. Uh, they can easily get exposed to HIV. And of course, uh, healthcare workers through a needle stick injury any, any device that actually penetrates the skin directly into the bloodstream can, especially if it's contaminated, of course, can lead to HIV infection. And the third uh, mode of transmission is through an infected mother to her fetus through the placenta. Okay. Now, there are uh, misconceptions about HIV transmission that many people can, uh, seem to, uh, to get confused with now, HIV does not transmit actually uh, casually. It does not transmit through air or water. Uh, saliva, sweat, tears, uh, and even closed mouth kissing does not transmit HIV. Insects and pets, they do not transmit HIV and sharing towels, food, and drinks with an HIV-infected person does not transmit the virus. Th these are points that we need to uh, make sure that the public know it. And if they know that, the discrimination and criminalization of, uh, of persons who are infected with HIV will definitely uh, decrease. So it is our responsibility uh, to, to do that. Now, maybe some people will ask, why insects they do not transmit HIV even though the insect is actually sucking blood uh, it, it's a valid question and the answer is very simple because insects usually they they, they do not uh, support the growth 
of the HIV virus. This is something what we call tissue tropism, or there are certain biological vectors that uh, support the growth of certain uh, viruses or bacteria, and they do not support the growth of others. So HIV is one of those viruses that is not supported by the growth of insects, which is, of course, is a good thing. It's really a blessing. Otherwise, if an insect can transmit HIV, that would really be a disaster. So uh, please let us all know that these are the methods of transmission versus the methods of non-transmission of HIV. Next. Now, speaking of transmission, these are the fluids that are associated with the transmission of HIV. You're talking about blood, of course. Then the sexual uh, fluids are the semen or the cum, the rectal fluids, the vaginal fluids, uh, the pre-seminal fluid, and of course, breast milk. You see, a, a mother, an infected mother, can transmit HIV not only through pregnancy via the placenta, but also through breast feeding. So this is something that also uh, we need to raise awareness that if a mother is has been confirmed to have HIV, then she should not breastfeed her uh, child in order to avoid uh, the transmission of HIV. Next. Now, that will lead us to HIV testing. Now, a lot has been done for the past uh, 40 years, ever since HIV was uh, discovered, and especially in the past 20 years, to be particularly, um, the availability of tests, even though it's not 100% uh, all over the world, but um, there has been a, a, a progress in, in many countries in terms of uh, the availability of the test, uh, the awareness of people that they can actually do the test themselves. There are many over-the-counter um, uh, tests uh, that are easy uh, to perform and, and can be performed at home. Usually these are screening tests that uh, enables a person to find out whether he or she is HIV positive or not. Now, uh, you need to know what type of tests you are looking for, whether you are detecting the, the level of antibodies or you are detecting the antigen or the virus itself. And uh, as, as I mentioned, you need to also understand what does a negative test result means versus a positive test result. A negative test result meaning that uh, it, it means two things, actually. Either you don't have HIV or you might have it, but uh, the virus is still at an initial stage of the infection that is not detectable yet, which is probably maybe in the first few days of, of exposure. What does a positive test result means? It means that you have an active infection and this requires immediate uh, treatment through the uh, heart uh, regimen, which is the highly active antiretroviral uh, therapy. Okay. So speaking of uh, home tests, okay, the next slide actually will show you one of the the home or in-home HIV tests, which is called the uh, Aura Quick, and this is actually approved by the FDA. Uh, I mean, it, it's it, it's most commonly found in the U.S. and North America. Uh, what what do you have in this uh, kit? Uh, it's very simple actually. Instructions. I mean, from the left to right, you can see. The icons, you have instructions on how to use the test. You have a disposable bag in order for you to actually put your sample. Then you have the swab itself. And this swab is a special type of swab whereby uh, the person will actually uh, take a swab of the upper and lower gum with, of course, the saliva uh, that surrounds the area. And then once it's done, immediately it has to be put inside this transport uh, media uh, and then you have the booklets and of course contact numbers of uh, the centers that this test will be sent to so of course in, in the u.s for example they have come a long way on sexual education and especially hiv uh, treatment centers because uh, the number of infections uh, over there is, is really high and of course they have uh, i mean um, all the uh, 
the requirements that enables them to 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 develop a test so yeah people over there uh, in north america and europe general are very much aware about uh, hiv and many of them they perform these tests uh, in home next please so uh, what if a person have hiv actually um it, it's not the end of the world definitely not it was uh it was considered actually a death sentence back in the 80s simply because uh, there were no um, treatment uh, available and even if they were they were not as effective as uh, what they are now because the first generation of HIV treatment uh, appeared in the late 80s to the early 90s um, but uh, since the discovery until that time uh, millions and thousands of people actually perished so uh, living with hiv nowadays uh should not or should never be criminalized or stigmatized uh because people they need to know that hiv or acquiring hiv is not mainly due to a an immoral or promiscuous sexual activity people should should really change that perspective okay many people a, a, a healthcare worker can get an hiv simply from a needle stick injury nothing to do with a sexual uh, activity uh, an infant an infant uh, can get an hiv he or she can actually born with an hiv if the mother is infected and and that mother uh, did not know so uh, that kind of stigma it, it has to to end it is our responsibility to do so and because stigma usually affects uh, the person who is being stigmatized tremendously, mentally and physically. And we, we have to actually um, come to um, uh, the idea that it is normal to live with a person who is HIV positive. Because HIV now is not a deadly disease, or AIDS is not a deadly disease, is a chronic disease same as uh, diabetes a person with diabetes takes the diabetes medicine throughout his or her whole life same thing with hiv you can never get rid of the virus so it became more of a chronic disease so we need to learn to adapt to live with people now family planning is something very important those who are newlyweds they should think twice i mean if of course uh, one of the partners has been confirmed to have HIV, then uh, the family planning part, it is very important. What are the questions that you can ask yourself in order for you to, to plan a family? For example, what is the safest way to conceive? Is it a vaginal delivery or C-section? And uh, is HIV drugs uh, or are HIV drugs are going to cause complications to my baby? How can I uh, avoid HIV to my partner? especially if only one partner is infected and the other is not. Uh, and is my viral load uh, undetectable or detectable? And uh, what are the community programs available that we can use in order to plan our family? So these are the questions that um, they need to be asked in order to make sure that people living with HIV, they live a normal life and they are accepted by society. Next. And, you know, speaking of living with HID, of course, the idea is to reduce or even eliminate the HIV stigma. What is stigma? It's basically believing that certain groups can get HIV, okay? Or uh, can only certain group can get HIV. For example, only um, uh, sex workers can get HIV or only uh, those people who have multiple sex partners can get HIV. No, anyone is uh, exposed to get HIV because the, the, the transmission is not only sexually. The other way of stigmatizing is making moral judgment about people who take steps to prevent HIV. Like if a person or I mean, all of us here in this forum, we are advocates to prevent the spreads of HIV, right? So if someone else judge us about what we are doing, then this is called a uh, stigma. And uh, there's another form of stigma, which is actually uh, is very painful, that uh, some people, they believe that 
because that person got HIV due to an immoral sexual activity, then they deserve that. Or maybe prisoners who are living in a prison, they have done something in the past, and of course they regret it now. But because they have done that, some people think that they, they deserve to get HIV, which is very, very wrong and a very close-minded way of looking at things. We are all humans here, and we should always uh, help each other rather uh, than uh, doing the opposite. So these are the forms of stigma that should end. Now, just to give you a perspective on what is the situation of HIV, this is as of uh, 2019, there is 38 million individuals worldwide who are actually living with HIV. And among those, uh, 1,700,000 people have been detected as HIV, HIV positive in 2019 only and uh, 690,000 people have died of HIV AIDS in 2019 and about 68% uh, of adults living with HIV received antiretroviral therapy in 2019. Now 68, um, I wouldn't say it's a small number, no, it's, it, it's, it's a good percentage but definitely it can be increased uh, more and that comes with raising awareness and uh, pulling out the resources of governments, NGOs, and academia all together to reach uh, a much higher percentage of, of treatment coverage. So, I mean, the, the purpose, one of the purposes actually of conducting our forum, I believe, is because it comes in conjunction with the World AIDS Day 2020. And the theme uh, that the World Health Organization has set is global solidarity, resilient services. The idea here is to increase the versatility and the resilience of healthcare uh, services, not only to uh, you know to the cities, but even to rural areas, to people who are um, economically and educationally disadvantaged. It is the responsibility of every uh, person. So, uh, uh, so I, I believe this is a really good uh, theme and a very noble cause that all of us have the responsibility to, to share. So actually this image is taken from, uh, as a screenshot from the, uh, from the World Health Organization uh, website in conjunction with the World AIDS Day 2020. So uh, as a conclusion, how can we end the HIV uh, epidemic. A plan for America, actually this is not only in America, but uh, here because it was taken from uh, CDC, but uh, that actually applies to, to the whole world, is that diagnosis is the first step because HIV is one of those infections or diseases that you can never tell that a person is infected without proper laboratory test results. So uh, HIV testing is definitely um, one of the uh, most important aspects. Then uh, treatment, this will be followed by treatment, and it has to be a continuous treatment, okay? And this also will lead to protection of people who are at risk. You're talking about pre-exposure prophylaxis and post-exposure prophylaxis. And if these three elements have been covered, then this will lead to a quicker response to clusters of new cases. So the, this, these are the four pillars of our response to uh, suppress or to end the HIV epidemic, not only in America, but actually worldwide. So there's a lot to be done, but I think um, uh, medical students, uh, academics, researchers, and governments they all have the responsibility to do so. So, yeah, this is basically, I mean, uh, a brief uh, intro on what are the points that uh, everyone needs to know about HIV. All right, thank you, Dr. Sarat. It was very insightful um, that you actually discussed about the basic transmission methods and also um, 
how HIV is still very strongly stigmatized in our society. And of course, the readily test, um, laboratory testing kits and stuff provided by the government to facilitate the, the whole process. So um, without further ado, I'd like to proceed with the q and A. I mean, sorry, the discussion for the misconception of HIV and AIDS. Right, so let's start with our first question. Um, we start with Dr. Saad first, and then after that, um, the volunteers from class, they can um, put in their opinions also, all right? So why is HIV and AIDS being criminalized and discriminated against by the public? Well, uh, simply because uh, in the minds of many people, HIV is always associated with uh, immoral uh, activities, I mean, namely sexual activities. Uh, I mean, homosexuals or uh, even heterosexuals, uh, sex workers, and also uh, injecting drug uh, users. Uh, but, uh, but again, like I said, uh, of course, uh, this high risk group of people uh, they, they still transmit HIV, but the, the disease itself has uh, spread beyond uh, this high risk to include basically uh, every person. All, all of us are at risk of acquiring HIV. So uh, this is why the discrimination, because initially it was um, discovered among uh, a certain group of people who are high risk, and unfortunately that uh, initial uh, discovery somehow uh, uh, the perception of the disease um, remained in the minds of many people that yes, HIV is only associated with, with, with the promiscuous sex and injecting drug users. But what people don't know that it can be transmitted uh, through uh, in many other ways. So uh, this is why uh, the discrimination, the stigma. Um, Hafiz or Kai, we'll go ahead. So again, thank you, Jonathan, for the question. So from my point of view, working as a social worker, so we noticed that the public itself, they have very lack awareness about HIV and AIDS. Not many, especially young generation, knows a lot about HIV. HIV. What is HIV and AIDS? Itself? Yeah, this will also lead to the lack of knowledge. There are no... Uh, sexual education taught at school mm. so we have to do something about it we have to educate people not only young but all aspects of the community and also it's very sad to see that in malaysia we just we call it as muslim muslim country we have a conservative mindset so everyone we have like a mindset that is not open-minded they always discriminate people that are living with HIV. HIV. They, they always stigmatize. They always give a bad um, appearance to people that are affected by the HIV. And lastly, they always talk about HIV is always related with sex. Like but, Dr. Sahan said, yeah, immoral uh, things. But actually, HIV, it's more than, beyond than that. So. That is why uh, this uh, feedback we got from the uh, committee why uh, HIV is uh, being criminalized and discriminated by the public. Next. All right, thank you, Dr. Saad and Kai, and uh, and class. And here comes the second question. Let's go with um, the class first, and then Dr. Saad, vice versa. Yeah. So, why? Uh, sorry. What are the possible? Uh, what are the possible impacts if medical doctors and professionals are a part of this discrimination? You know, what are the possible implications of this? Yes, this is actually a very important uh, question. You see, uh, healthcare workers. I mean. Whether, whether doctors or nurses or paramedical uh, professionals, they are actually uh, the, the high risk, risk of, of group uh, uh, that can acquire HIV, um, especially when, when you're talking about, I mean, healthcare workers, you're talking about surgeons. Surgeons in particular, those who are uh, performing invasive uh, procedure, uh, the CDC has estimated that the average risk of uh, sporadic HIV and infection from an 
HIV infected surgeon to a patient during an invasive procedure is uh, about 2 to 24 uh, episodes of transmission per 1 million procedures. Now, the number is, is very small. It is really insignificant, but there's always a possibility for that. So uh, the, 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 the surgeons or the, 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 the healthcare workers' viral load is definitely a, um, a, a reason or a surrogate for potential infectivity to the patient. However, um, ethically speaking, uh, when we talk about medical uh, ethics and medical jurisprudence, um, that medical uh, doctor or healthcare worker should not be uh, penalized or criminalized just because he or she has acquired uh, HIV or has, uh, uh, I mean, developed or become HIV uh, positive. Now, if the person is a surgeon, there are many ways to actually deal with that. For example, if it's uh, an invasive procedure, then that surgeon, maybe uh, someone else, um, uh, can do it on his behalf just to ensure that that uh, the possibility of transmitting the virus to the patient is minimized. But uh, that healthcare worker should never uh, been, for example, kicked out of his uh, job just because he has HIV. Other healthcare workers, uh, they don't really perform invasive procedures. So, uh, for example, uh, family care physicians, uh, they don't perform surgical procedures. So, uh, them to, 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 to spread the virus into their patients, it is um, almost... Uh, almost in, in, indetectable, really. So uh, I believe that uh, the impact of uh, medical doctors, um, uh, it's, it's there, it's definitely there. We can never deny that it is there. There's a, a stigma, and, uh, but it, this should, uh, should, should really end because there is no um, possible uh, way that a, a medical doctor, especially a, a, a physician, who is dealing with patients uh, can uh, actively transmit uh, the, the virus unless an invasive procedure uh, is involved. Okay, thank you. What about um, Hafiz and Kai? Uh, from our experience working as social so worker, there are a few clients that came up to us and give your feedback, feedback about, about um, there are few situations they are facing discrimination, right? So one of the one of the impact, the obvious one is that it can jeopardize the successful of the treatment for the HIV. Or we can say that when a person get a treatment at some place and the doctor that treat the patient has discrimination, so the patient will feel like, oh, this doctor is very discriminate and he will think that oh I will not go to seek the not treatment and it yeah. mm -hmm. And also uh client also feel that uh for the key population uh itself that I, I talked uh, before this uh will afraid to get tested because of uh the doctors uh discriminate because of their sexual orientation, because of uh, yeah, what's going behind yeah. the patient itself. Yeah. So there are lots of clients that came out to us. Uh, they always thought, I mean, uh, unfortunately, there are medical doctors that does not really know much about which I mean AIDS, and that really leads to discrimination. It was very unfortunate, you can say that. So this judgment by the medical doctor should be stopped. So what we can do as a social worker, we can always give a support and motivation so that they can always be uh, adherence to their arguments. The three class also doing uh, a program, which is uh, we will go to a government clinics or hospital. We will do a sanitizing program, which we can engage with the NAs, we can engage with the doctors to telling them that actually uh, sexual orientation or everything should be put aside first 
but the patient itself should be more yeah we should say, yeah. prioritize the patient mm -hmm. first right? and it slowly in yeah. Malaysia evolved that uh, more to friendly uh, community to our key population community and on the top of that we can see like improvement right like yeah. from time to time we can see like there are many doctors out there especially in Malaysia are accepting to talk about HIV and AIDS they don't really uh, discriminate what I mean by not really discriminate is that they do not relate. For example, like I having HIV, for example, and then the doctor will relate back to the to the religion itself. So it was it wasn't really mm. a nice um, things things mm. to say to your client actually. So uh, what we do as a social worker, we try to engage more and more with medical both sides, doctors, so medical yeah. doctors and also the clients uh, to uh, they are totally understand for what we have been doing. Yeah. Next. So uh, this is uh, the type. So how how the healthcare workers can uh, approach is more professionally. So in our NGO point of view, uh the health workers must show the understanding more and the big it word is, is, uh, is empathy. empathy yes uh the healthcare workers should imagine be in the client shoe rather than to you know judgmental rather than to discriminate them they should be more understanding so the key word is that showing empathy towards the client itself and next is that um, the healthcare workers should always gain knowledge. Mm. I mean, there are so many knowledge that you can learn. However, not everyone knows about HIV and AIDS, and that includes healthcare workers as well. I mean, there are so many types of doctors that specifically in certain field, but not everyone knows about HIV and AIDS. Maybe they just know it from the media, like how the media pro portray HIV and AIDS and this, their surrounding and, and that they came up with the idea that HIV and AIDS is a very, uh, you know, bad disease that we call it. Uh, back in the day, they call it as uh, gay-related yeah. disease, right? So it was very unfortunate. So my advice and our advice is that Healthcare workers should always gain more knowledge. And to gain, gaining more knowledge, they can always do training. Yeah, more, more training. And yeah. currently, we also get a visit from uh, Ministry of Health. Uh, certain of the MAs and the doctor will come to us, to our office, and uh, knowing more about what actually they experience with the clients. Uh, because we are the one, is the medium in between of the uh, medical in the uh, medical and the client itself so that is why we need more and more training uh, yeah. among the healthcare workers from NGO side we also did like few kind of workshops like, mm, for yeah. example like media sensitization mm. which means that what kind of keywords that you should use to address people living with HIV what kind of the right word to say uh, are you very um, can you ask the person status are you HIV positive? Is that right yeah, thing so to so say? Uh, yeah. So we have that kind of workshop to sensitize, especially among healthcare workers, so that they will understand much better about what is HIV and AIDS it's all about. And lastly, healthcare workers should be more accepting, be more a be more of the, Yes. Yeah. I see. All right. Um, it was a very informative. Um discussion just now by Dr. Saad and also the volumes of class. You know, we understand that why doctors does it um, in, um, unintentionally because they won't protect themselves, you know, like surgeons and stuff. And also, um, we also have to consider um, the, the professional safety and also our uh, the emotion and the possible effects on the clients if doctors um, do discriminate indirectly or unconsciously. So I think like, like resonating what um, class mentioned, 
I think sensitization and also workshops, you know, these are a very, very good um, way to engage and how to um, normalize this whole and avoid the discrimination. So comes to the third question, um, from class, um, what are the possible medical uh, medication regime and then where can where can people living with HIV or you know how how can they um, get their hands on medication on um, for this um, for sorry how can they get medications to treat the uh, HIV and AIDS? Okay, so for the medication regime for PLHIV, actually we can find it. Uh, either in a government clinics or hospitals regarding private clinics and also uh, bisexual NGO. So firstly, you can go to the government clinics. So if you are a public and then you want to know your status, you can go directly uh, to clinic, uh, any, what we call as a clinic kesihatan, clinic kesihatan, you are on a nearby clinic kesihatan mm. or you can always visit hospital to get access for the treatment. Yeah, and uh, for this testing, it's available for only one ringgit actually for Malaysia, and it's, it's all cheap. Uh, you just go there, and then you just say that you want to do the VCT. It's a code name for us actually VCT, voluntary uh, counseling testing. testing. If you are scared to say that I want to do the HIV or STD testing, you can say that you want to do the VCT. And uh, for the PHIV, actually, we got a free treatment, free treatment for mm -hmm. heart, heart. This one is for Malaysian. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, we got another track also, we got a private clinic, uh, also got HIV and STD testing, uh, but uh, got the fees for a certain amounts. And uh, because there are actually few of our clients that really not comfortable to go to the government health clinic, so we, we always um, give an option, give an option yeah. which is we can always provide them with private clinics. So, there are so many clinics, yeah, such as uh, that get uh, collaboration from us is MUC Healthcare Clinics uh, in Jalan Alu Bukit Bintang. So we can go there and uh, see the doctor and then get the medication. And other than that, you can go also to any sexual health NGO around Malaysia. You can contact them and then uh, you can uh, get CBT, what you call it CBT is Community Based Testing, which is the community itself, which is uh, us, are trained by the KKM to do the testing. We got three kind of testing. Yeah, HIV, exactly. syphilis, and hepatitis C. So we are using rapid test kit, which is the same test kit actually used, used at, at the clinic. clinic. Time. So actually, the problem itself evolved from the clinic, and then but then the client feels that oh, I'm not comfortable to go there, and then we go to the private clinic, and actually for the CBT. Uh, it's evolved from the concern that yeah. are told by the client itself. Because yeah. sometimes there are, you know, when you go to the government health clinic, the waiting line is too long. Some clients are rushing mm -hmm. and they don't have time. They usually free on weekends. So what they can do is that they can always go to the private clinic or they can contact us. Mm -hmm. So, but there are also a client that not really uh, can afford to have a testing at a private clinic so they can come to us. We can do checkup and the CBT program mm -hmm. is only free, free of charge. charge. We give a uh, free counseling also. Yeah, next. Okay, so this is uh, how uh, public can approach. So we got the three, uh, three types to uh, approach this. Uh, our programs. First, you can just walk in, walk in, take an appointment by the NGO, and third, by our promotional. promotional. So, firstly, you just can uh, walk in to any government clinics or hospital, and you just say that uh, I don't want to do the testing, I want to do the VCT, or you can say I want to do the HIV or STD testing. Must be specific because if you say that I want to do blood test, they will do another test. So, have to be more specific. HIV or STD testing. If you're shy to saying that, because we are knowing that Malaysia is shy to say. So you can just say that we want to do the VCT testing. So they will do directly for the screening HIV testing. And secondly, we got appointment through our NGO. Uh, 
we got CBT uh, program. program. Yeah. As I told, so this is the flow. As you can see on the screen, this is the flow. So currently, we will be working uh, under CBT project. We call it as Jump Test KL. So what we did is that uh, we offer free HIV, syphilis, and also hepatitis C testing. So as you can see on the screen, is that this is how the the procedure from the client side. So you can always um, uh, book an appointment with us, and then we arrange a date with you, mm -hmm. and we will begin with pre counseling, and then screening, and then post counseling. So it's pretty much like easy process. We're always available on weekend and weekdays, so public can always reach out to us. Yeah. Next. So public also can approach through our promotional events and SNS. So for events, we will opening booths for any event, especially for December. As we know, December is the month of the World AIDS Day. So many booths that will open, yeah, and then uh, we will give out information how you want to get tested, uh, and then uh, which area the nearest to you, uh, and then. Uh, from this booth, we can, we can actually, uh, if the client are scared to go in alone, actually we as an outreach worker can accompany them to the clinics, private, either private or the government itself, we will be the, uh, the face of them to booking uh, the appointment itself for them and then we will give the appointment to them. Huh? And then we got also from our networking sites, which is Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can reach and find us on our Instagram and Twitter, myclassorg, and our Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because I believe it. that people nowadays, especially young generation, they're always on social media. So that's why we use social networking site. So we always, um, we are actually available on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Also, yeah, we are available on dating apps. Yeah. So there are so many dating apps apps that you can give a name like WeChat, WeChat in the grind the right neighborhood every dating apps actually yeah. that we approach so every, uh, every time you open your dating apps and you see uh in the profile that said get tested or jump test know your status actually it's part of our marketing and it's uh, uh one, one of our colleagues our yeah. colleagues as our wish worker to reach all the public uh to get tested yeah, because um, it's very sad to say that um, if you are LGBT in Malaysia, uh, people will hiding, you know, in the closet. They will not show up. So one of the way to solve this problem is that we are using this dating app because there are so many people, right, on this dating app. So that is one of the effective way. I think. I can say one of the effective ways that we get our client and we can go out and reach and tell us, oh, get tested, know tested. your know your status. status and be ensure that you are free from HIV and STD. Yeah. Next. Okay, so who should you guys contact individual? So uh, currently for class, we got as I said, under the, the HTSKP program, we got outreach worker and case worker. So there are around 14 outreach workers. So you can contact through our uh, personal media social or our media social, my class ORG. And for the case worker, uh, they are focused on more clinics. So yeah. for those who are afraid, uh, I will suggest you to find clinic that have a uh, case worker itself. So, they will be comforting you guys and then uh, keep uh, keep you guys on track to get the medication, to get tested because uh, as a client, you have to, if you are high risk, you must have test uh, three months. Each of three months, you must uh, get tested. Pass your window period. Yes. Right. So I bet the audience might be asking, what is the difference between the outreach and the, and the case, case worker? worker. So basically, outreach worker, the word itself is that you basically are similar with the social worker. You go out and reach to the key population. What kind of key population, which is kind of, yeah, yeah, just now, which is MSM, MSM, transgender, people, people with injecting drugs, uh, 
uh, uh, transgender population or even straight people. Yeah. So yeah, you can reach uh, out workers. So for the case worker, basically they stand by at clinics. So currently we have five clinics that we have collaboration with. We have a uh, clinic set at Chiras. We have clinic set at UTC Sentul. We have clinic set at Jinjang. Clinic set at Klanik Jaya. And also clinic set at Shala Section Seven. So we, so this case worker mostly they will handle a client that has been diagnosed with HIV. So, because we understand that when you are diagnosed with HIV, the you need yeah, yeah, you need someone to support you. You need uh, emotional and physical and mentally support. So, case worker, case worker will always there. be there for you. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you can go to our website also to gain more information about what we are doing. We always... Uh, updating our services on our website and, and you know, currently actually we have another new program yeah. we call it as Mercules where we co collaborate with the professional counsellor uh, they will give advice on mental health and also nutritional uh, uh, for the PLS who like newly diagnosed yeah. Yeah. and also not actually it's not only for PLS it's mm -hmm. actually open, open for, for everyone, everyone. Basically, we offer this kind of service is free of charge. I mean, we want to help the community. We understand that uh, people really need our help. So that's why we came up with, you know, CBT. Mm -hmm. And then we will running up with uh, cookies mm -hmm. program, program and so on. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Hafiz and Kai. It was very insightful that how um, that how you actually like tell us in detail how how you guys actually did the public engagement, and I think <clears throat> I think a lot of people will benefit from this, especially when you have when you mention about um which clinic that actually, um do you, do you, that you guys provide case workers. I think if people uh people living with HIV actually watching this now, they would actually like take note of this, and it would be very useful for them. Um, coming to Doctor Saad. Since they have already came up with the public engagement, would you like to come up with a medical uh, point of view? So, uh, of course, th thank you guys. Uh, actually, uh, I didn't know that you guys, uh, you do all of these uh, activities. You, you are really active and uh, I, I really salute you for that. Uh, it is something that it definitely society needs, especially those who are um, uh, economically disadvantaged, educationally disadvantaged, uh, they don't have that much of awareness. Uh, definitely this is a step in the right direction in order to provide support, not only uh, treatment-wise, but of course uh, mentally um, and, and moral uh, support. So yes, um, how to approach uh, HIV infection in the society yeah, uh, definitely you have the NGOs uh, play a very important role and government agencies also uh, in terms of setting up HIV uh, uh, screening tests, uh, clinics, uh, or even um, like, for example, in, in the States, uh, they have uh, specialized centers uh, to treat uh, HIV, to test and treat HIV. Uh, and again, this uh, also boils down to the fact that sexual education over there is very common. So from an early age, as, as early as, uh, uh, you know, early teenage uh, teenagers, they, uh, the, 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 the education of, of sexual uh, um, uh, behavior has been uh, an integral part of, of, of society uh, I mean, in, in the Western world in general. So this has to uh, come uh, to uh, here, I mean, in this part of the world, uh, there are many countries uh, who are, are very con conservative, either uh, religion-wise or culture-wise. And the problem with with, with these uh, uh, with these uh, countries is that if a person is infected, he or she most probably uh, they, they wouldn't know. But even if they know, they actually will hide it because it will be considered a shame to even talk about it or uh, share it with, with your family members. 
you will definitely be uh, stigmatized and this is wrong and and that kind of uh, behavior will actually increase the rate of infection rather than uh, suppressing it so uh, yes the public uh, plays a very important role government uh, by actually providing uh, HIV testing kits by subsidizing uh, the uh, the treatment regimens uh, I believe like uh, Malaysia is one of the countries who uh, are uh, very active in, 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 the, in the fight against HIV uh, and even the the, the treatment regimens uh, it is uh, subsidized which is something uh, really impressive uh, and there is a lot of research uh, uh, that has been conducted uh, through many public universities uh, about the prevalence of HIV, especially in high-risk areas, uh, like for example, prisons. Uh, prisons uh, usually uh, are um, the perfect uh, place to uh, spread HIV. Not only HIV, HIV and TB, because you know these two infections they 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 they, they kind of come hand in hand. There, there's what we call a co-infection of HIV with tuberculosis. So, uh, so, so prisons are uh, one of those places that um, uh, governments and, and even uh, research centers, they, they pay very careful attention uh, to them because those prisoners, once they are released, if they were found to be HIV positive, then of course it is responsibility of, 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 the, of, of that individual to follow up and to make sure that uh, the, the infection is, is being controlled uh, as much as possible. So everybody plays a role here, and I salute you guys uh, for uh, everything that you have been doing and continue uh, to do. Please uh, keep it up. All right, thank you, Dr. Saad. Um, all right, and before before we proceed to the last second segment, of, sorry, before we proceed to the MythBuster segment, um, I'd like to remind the public, you know, if you're watching this, um, there will be a feedback form being circulated uh, in the Facebook or YouTube. We would really appreciate if you can fill it up. It would really um, help us better cater our events to you in the future. All right, so coming back to MythBusters, um, the whole idea of this forum is to debunk myths about HIV and AIDS. So let's just come to the first question. Um, HIV infection and AIDS are a death sentence. Um, Dr. Saad, what do you think? Yes, it used to be back in the 80s. Definitely, it was a death sentence. Um, many people have uh, perished, uh, actually, simply because uh, the disease what was not clearly understood and also uh, the the first generation of uh, HIV drugs or highly active antiretroviral therapy did not come uh, in the disposal of the public un until probably the, the, the late 80s to, to, to early 90s. So it, it was a death sentence, but definitely it is not nowadays. Now it is considered as a chronic disease as simple as that a person who is infected with HIV will have the virus uh, for the remaining of their lives there are very very few cases of a complete uh, cure of HIV uh, I mean there were few reports a uh, few individuals but these are um, very rare cases that we cannot uh, really based upon uh, simply because genetically some individuals uh, their immune system shows or their immune cells shows uh, a more robust uh, approach to actually combat and eliminate the HIV virus. Uh, but unfortunately, majority of the people, um, they don't have that yet. Scientists are studying this uh, in order to identify what are the genes in these individuals that can actually suppress and totally eliminate the virus. This probably will need I would say uh, five to ten years later to develop uh, a gene therapy uh, for that. But until then, we should never consider HIV as a death sentence. It is just a chronic disease, and it should remain like that. I see. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sa. What about class? Uh, what about Hafiz and Kai? What do you guys think? Uh, I do agree with Dr. Sa. In fact, we would like to share that our president, his Mr. Andrew Tan, 
which is the president for class, he has been living with HIV for almost more than 30 years, right? Like 26 years. So yeah, back in the days, people not knowing so much about HIV, um, they are, you know, the medical doctors, they are trying and error which kind of medication that was suitable, su suitable but nowadays, is not anymore will be death sentence. So Mr. Andrew Tan is actually a person that who openly openly to public. He always uh, educate continuously about HIV and AIDS. So that is the main objective of our NGO actually. Alright, that's very insightful from medical uh, POV and our class POV. The uh, second question, the second year is people living with HIV or, you know, PW HIV usually look very sick. You know, like this is what Dr. mentioned. Um, they, they will be, it, it is a chronic illness and, you know, them being looking sick, um, is it relevant? Um, what about class? I'd like to hear from class first this time because you guys are engaging the public constantly. So, um, this is another myth that uh, always goes around the yeah. our public. Yeah. That's why our president, Mr. Andrew Tan, is openly said that he is PLHIV, who has been living with HIV uh, almost 26 years. But he is still standing together with us, still uh, give an education about how to handle, and he's actually pretty healthy. I mean, yeah. like, he, I mean, like, he, he has been living with HIV even much more longer than my age, for God's sake, and he looks very, very healthy. So the myth that people say about, oh, you are living with PLHIV, you must look sick, you must have, you know, have this, um, you look very skinny, or that, that that's the myth, that's not correct. That's it could be so many factor, but... You cannot put like, oh, you look so skinny and healthy and everything, and you judge them by having an HIV. It is very, very bad meat, and we have to change this kind of mindset. I see. What about Dr. Saad? Yes, absolutely. I, I agree that, again, that was the case in the early 80s where the virus was uh, first discovered. Uh, definitely, and when it was actually discovered back then, it was already too late. It was already actually AIDS, not really an HIV anymore. It was AIDS, uh, whereby, you know, the immune system is totally destroyed and the patients who come to the clinic will exhibit all sorts of opportunistic infections. So, and there were even no treatment back then. They were just like uh, treatment to, uh, to actually manage these opportunistic infections rather than the cause itself. So definitely uh, people will look very sick and most of them will die. But definitely this is not the case nowadays. In fact, there are many people who were diagnosed with HIV in, back in the early 90s and they are still living until now. When they were diagnosed with HIV, they were probably uh, 25 to 30 years of age. Fast forward 30 years and they are still 60 and even over 60 years of age and they are living a normal life. Of course taking into consideration that they take the uh, highly active antiretroviral regimen regularly on daily basis because taking this treatment uh, sporadically you know you take it for uh, one or two months then you uh, cut it down for one or two months and then you go back to it by doing so you're actually allowing the virus to uh, initiate its uh, or resume its uh, replication cycle and this will, will cause more damage to, to, to the immune system. So with proper uh, treatment, with proper testing and monitoring and screening, all HIV, uh, AIDS, uh, who are people who are infected with it, they look normal and they can live a normal life rather than looking very sick. This is a myth. All right, okay. Okay, so the third question, um, Dr. Saad, um, what do you think about all homosexual uh, individuals have HIV and AIDS? Because it was mentioned that um, one of the main causes of it is um, men who have sex with men. 
So what do you think? Well, of course, uh, not necessarily, because uh, even men who are sexual with men, they can use uh, protection such as uh, condoms. And condoms, even though it does not protect 100%, uh, from acquiring HIV or any other sexual transmitted disease, but it definitely plays a role in uh, breaking the chain of, uh, of infection. So definitely not all homosexuals and heterosexuals as well. That goes both ways for men and women. Not all of them, they have HIV. Uh, only a person who have HIV and who have unprotected sex with someone who does not have, of course, there's a higher risk of acquiring the virus. Otherwise, if, uh, if the right protection is being uh, used, such as condoms, if uh, pro, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis is being used and post-exposure prophylaxis also is being used, these are all elements that can lead to uh, very strong and robust prevention from acquiring HIV. So the answer is definitely um, no, not all homosexuals, they have HIV and AIDS. Right, um, what about class? Um, since you guys engage with the public, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I do agree with the doctor. Actually, not all homosexual individuals have HIV and AIDS. Actually, uh, we, we must say that people that uh, practice a risky behavior is very high risk to get infected with HIV and AIDS. We cannot say that, oh, uh, gay men have um, HIV and AIDS or people men sex with men. We do have the fact that there are certain group of people that also infected with HIV. So this myth is completely not true because from our, from our experience, we also have clients from respective background. Mm -hmm. We have clients from um, uh, people with injection drug, we have a uh, transgender, we have female sex worker, so it's not very true. And if uh, this is additional information, if you want to look at the statistic about um, Malaysian data about how many people get affected by HIV and AIDS, you can always look up at MAC or we call it as Malaysian AIDS Council. So every year they will release a report. Um, I think last year, uh, the difference between homosexual and heterosexual is only 3%. 3%. So the homosexual is 49, uh, and the heterosexual is uh, 50 something, yeah. So it's almost similar. So we cannot put the same shoe. Uh, we cannot level all people that, had, that got HIV and AIDS are homosexual. Yes, I, I actually believe it. Um, I actually agree with uh, both of <clears throat> both of you guys, um, all of you guys. And the next question um, from Hafiz or Kai, um, is HIV only transmitted through unprotected sex? Um, resonating what you just said just now, would you like to further elaborate? HIV is transmitted through unprotected sex. Uh, however, it you can get infected through uh, sharing the middle, especially, especially between the drug user and then from the mother to the child. So we cannot simply say that, oh, uh, you are having unprotected sex. Also, that is the main and the only reason that you get HIV. They could have like the other two factors. So this myth is actually is not true. So you can always get infected through the other two uh, factors that I mentioned just now. Yeah. Um, what about Dr. Sa'ad? Yes, very, very true. I mean, uh, sexual intercourse, of course, is one of those. And as we mentioned, uh, the fluids that are associated in transmitting HIV are the vaginal fluids, rectal fluid, preseminal fluid. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you have blood. And then uh, you have the breast uh, milk. So definitely not only unprotected uh, sex, but as well, uh, you have also uh, blood contaminated products, needle stick injuries, drug users, and even uh, vertically from a mother to uh, an infant through the placenta or through breastfeeding. And this is the point that we always need to stress to the public that please, you need to change your perspective 
that acquiring HIV is not only through promiscuous sex, but there are so many other ways uh, to acquiring it. I see, I see. It, it, it is very insightful. Um, okay, let's just break down, uh, try to debunk this um, myth. Will sharing towels, cutleries, or food, or even anything intimate can transmit HIV? Uh, absolutely not. Really, there are no uh, evidence whatsoever to support uh, that. Uh, HIV is one of those viruses who uh, they, they don't have the ability to uh, transmit, you know, when like you talk about skin to skin touching, unless, of course, if there is a, a bruise or a cut in that skin that actually can lead to a blood vessel. Uh, the idea is to have exposure to any mucosal surface or blood. This will definitely uh, lead to an HIV transmission. But you talk about towels or food, uh, air, water. Uh, it's not the mode of transmission that supports uh, HIV. There are other viruses who can be transmitted through that. You're talking about Ebola, for example. Ebola is one of those viruses who can uh, easily be um, transmitted from one person to another by only uh, a touch. Uh, but of course, not, not only like a, a touch of an intact skin, but you're talking about touching a wound or a discharge of a person or any mucosal surface. It can uh, that person can acquire uh, Ebola or even uh, Marburg virus, but HIV, um, no, no, there are no reports on that. I see. Okay. Um, uh, what about Hafiz and Kai? I'm pretty sure you have clients who come up with you with such questions, right? Yeah, exactly. So this means it actually is not true. You cannot get transmit HIV through share, sharing towels, cutlery, or food. This is completely, uh, I can say, rubbish because HIV just like Dr. Saad mentioned just now, it needs a, a medium in its host, medium host, which is a fluid, like a blood fluid, vagina fluid, and, and so on. So sharing towels, calories, or food does not transmit HIV. However, we have to face that reality in nowadays that the media, all in the movies, they always portray the bad way. They, they always say that, oh, you can get HIV from, you know, touching, from hugging, sharing towels. And we have to educate ourselves and educate everyone that you cannot get transmitted through touching, sharing towels, and calories or food. I see. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, um, we can do it Dr. Saad first, and then after we have this Kai. Um, with pregnant mothers with um, diagnosed HIV positive, um, what are the possibilities or, you know, um, it, will it be like a determined fate that their uh, newborns will be HIV positive? Uh, so, okay, uh, the answer is that, uh, of course, pregnant mothers who are HIV uh, positive, uh, there are actually many factors uh, for that. Of course, the fact that the mother, the pregnant mother, knows her HIV status, that's one thing. And there's only one way to, to, to do that is through testing. And the testing uh, can be done, uh, a screening test first to screen the antibodies and a confirmatory test followed by uh, to screen the antigen, actually, which is the viral uh, load itself. If these two tests are positive, then definitely the mother or the pregnant mother is infected. Now, the question is whether uh, the baby will 100% be infected or not. It's not necessarily, because even if the pregnant mother is infected, she can undergo immediately a highly anti-active retroviral uh, therapy regimen regularly throughout the entire course of pregnancy and this treatment uh, has uh, over 25 different types of uh, antiretroviral medications whereby uh, the, the, the clinician will choose three or four combination of these uh, and uh, of course uh, you're, you're talking about 25 drugs 
that belong to six different classes, you know, from uh, nucleotide reverse transcriptase, fusion inhibitors, integrase strand uh, transfer inhibitors, and so on. Various different classes that can cater to various different uh, patients. Uh, so the mother can have uh, a, a very safe pregnancy if she follows the uh, heart regimen strictly. This is one. The second option is that uh, if she is, you know, still unsure or afraid that her baby might get HIV, then you always have the cesarean section delivery that prevents uh, the newborn from, you know, traveling through the birth canal. And, uh, of course, if the mother is infected with HIV, her birth canal or the vagina will, uh, will, will harbor the virus itself. This is natural. So in order to avoid that, a C-section is recommended uh, to avoid uh, uh, encountering HIV, not only HIV, but any other uh, sexually transmitted uh, diseases. So the, to answer that, uh, not necessarily all HIV positive pregnant mothers will deliver HIV positive pregnant babies. I see. Okay, what about um, Hafsa and Kai? Do you guys normally have clients who are pregnant and what are the outcomes of the delivery normally? Uh, actually, I do agree with Dr. Saad saying this now. So, um, I want to share you the fact that Malaysia, actually, one of the country among Asia yes, Pacific, Pacific country, that probably. probably has zero transmission from mother that had HIV and to the babies. So, we can be proud of that. So, ever since that, there is no cases reported that HIV mother have will have a HIV baby so there's no reporting cases so that, that that is something a very good achievement that we see an improvement in everything that we do and all of people that get involved with it so it's something that we can always look forward however we we have a problems when we are dealing with um sexual, sexual. identity especially among uh, LGBT people. So we have to work really hard to actually prevent HIV transmission among LGBT communities. Yeah. I see, I see. Okay, that's very insightful, thank you. Um, okay, um, just a few more questions before we come to the public Q&A, all right? Um, is there a traditional or alternative medicine that can treat HIV and AIDS? Um, Hafiz and Kai, have you actually heard of clients coming up to you with questions like this? Yes, there, there are a few clients that came up to us asking like, oh, uh, is uh, eating this kind of herbs, uh, uh, should we mandi bunga, they call. Yeah, yeah. so, so this, this is actually a myth. The only treatment is just very effective. Effective to prevent HIV, just like Dr. Saad say, is heart, highly anterior to viral therapy treatment. And there are no traditional or alternative way to cure HIV or AIDS. So everything that you say, like, uh, you know, like many people are so advanced, they always be on social media. So sometimes you be see like oh this kind of herb can cure like so many type of diseases including hiv which is not true so this myth is completely incorrect i see what about dr Sar? i mean as an academician as a clinician um i am very sure that you are much much more experienced in the art but have you ever came across any paper citing or you know any any journals that actually suggested such um, alternative medicine? Uh, I mean, uh, the only alternative, uh, actually, there, there is no uh, traditional treatment uh, to treat HIV. Even the heart does not really treat or cure HIV per se. Um, but uh, so, of course, traditional medicine or uh, there is no reported uh, um, medicine uh, that is actually able to, to treat or cure HIV. 
what some of these uh, traditional um, medicine can do is just to uh, enhance your immunity. That's all. It's like an immune uh, booster. And this is something good. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it is, uh, it is not recommended. No, ma many people, that they have the belief that some traditional medicine, it strengthens your immunity, which uh, in some cases it, it can. Uh, there are also other ways to uh, enhance or, um, you know, boost up your immunity, you know, through regular exercise and workout, eating healthy, basically, all sorts of vitamins and minerals, all, all of these, I mean, uh, regular sleep patterns, decreased stress, all of these can actually uh, boost your immunity because as you all know that HIV is uh, a disorder of the immune system, as simple as that. So if there is any uh, way to enhance your immunity, that would be a good thing. And if it means uh, uh, taking some kind of herbs, uh, by all means, but the public needs to know that these herbs that you take, no matter what is the name of it, no matter what is the origin of it, there is no herb uh, that can actually cure HIV or, um, or even treat HIV or AIDS. Uh, but they can only enhance your immunity to a certain level, if, but if you are, infected confirmed infected case of hiv then definitely you you can still use this traditional herb actually there is no harm but you should definitely seek uh, immediate medical attention to start the highly active antiretroviral therapy i see um yes i agree with um <clears throat> what hafiz and Kairu said and I, I definitely agree with dr. what dr Saad mentioned and I just had to resonate with what Dr. Saad mentioned. I think as of now, there is no definite cure for HIV and AIDS. We can, I mean, what we can do as medical professionals is just to suppress it and, you know, bring, bring down the viral load to undetectable because right now in uh, this current World AIDS Day 2020, the slogan is undetectable equal untransmissible. So I think it's just to resonate with that, you know, I think that that would, that would be very great if the public knows about this. Okay, um, the next question. All right, is there a need for protection or condom if people living with HIV have coitus or, you know, in mundanely have sex with another person living with HIV? So, yeah, doctor. Yes, yes, there is actually. Okay, uh, for three main uh, reasons. Number one. Uh, you see, e even if you are infected with HIV, uh, what what are you trying to do is actually to decrease the viral load in your system. So if you are infected with HIV and you have sex with someone who is also infected with HIV, you are getting a fresh dose of the virus. Uh, so that, that defeats the whole purpose. Uh, so what, what you should do instead is definitely you should use protection combined with heart treatment. So this is number one, to decrease the viral load of acquiring a fresh dose of the virus. Number two, uh, using protection, of course, prevents not only HIV, but other uh, sexually transmitted diseases, you know, from gonorrhea, syphilis, herpes, warts. Uh, so co-infection of HIV with these other sexually transmitted diseases is also uh, a, a risky uh, behavior and the third uh, reason why uh, infected people should use condoms is also to avoid unwanted pregnancies because uh, you don't want uh, the woman to to especially if that woman is hiv positive for her to become uh, pregnant with a potentially hiv positive uh, infant right so this is something that we should all avoid so to answer the question, definitely there is a need for protection, even if that person is having uh, sex with an HIV-infected person. I see. Thank you, Doctor. Um, what about Hafiz and Kai? What would you normally advise your patient? I'm, I'm your clients. I'm pretty sure they would have questions like this. So I actually agree with Dr. Sa'ai. So uh, we have been working with community like ever since the establishment of class so especially when we go and reach out them in the dating apps they will always put you know the status like on preps or undetectable uh, last text 
last That's question, good. which is date with so on and so forth. You should not easily uh, trust that information because people can always manipulate. They can put anything on that. So the main thing is that you you always need to protect yourself first. Think of yourself first. Yeah. Protect yourself first. So always use condom. Yeah. Regardless, uh, the person have HIV and you want to have sex with a person with also living with HIV, there is a need to use a condom. Yeah. Uh, I just need to add one thing here is that we cannot just simply say, um, I mean, just use condoms. There are many different types of condoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the, the 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 right way of using the condom is one thing, and the right type of condom is also the, 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 so. Yeah. The most yeah, the most um, uh, clinically proven uh, type of condoms that actually provide protection is actually the latex. latex. Yes. 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 So this is something also we should always uh, raise awareness uh, to to the public. Yeah. All right. Um, the next question. Ah, right. Okay. So it comes to the prevention method. Um, let's go with the clinical aspect first, and then let and then follow with the public aspect of it. Doctor, would you like to have <clears throat> you like to carry on? Of course. So uh, in terms of prevention, I mean, the world and the pharmaceutical companies have come a long way. Uh, I mean, uh, you're talking about the pre-exposure prophylaxis drugs. These are a group of drugs that are uh, used or given uh, to prevent HIV infection, especially for high-risk uh, uh, people. You're talking about healthcare workers or even uh, um, uh, sex workers and, 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 and so on. It is effective if it's taken immediately after suspected exposure. You're talking about 24 to 48 hours of suspected exposure, they are effective. The longer the time, the less the effect of these uh, uh, pre-exposure prophylactic drugs, uh, I mean, uh, appear. Now, the other form of, of, of protection or prevention is actually post-exposure, and that is uh, very useful, especially for healthcare workers, those who are dealing with a needle stick injury or those for example, surgeons who are operating on an HIV uh, infected uh, patient and there was like a spill of uh, blood and, and that surgeon, uh, I mean, uh, had like a, a minor cut in the skin. So there is always this possibility of acquiring uh, the, the, the virus um, and, and using this post exposure uh, prophylaxis helps definitely in suppressing the viral load. The key word here is suppressing viral load because uh, with all of these uh, methods uh, you need a drug to actually control the replication of the virus now uh, these are the preventative uh, methods in terms of uh, pre and post exposure now of course the prevention also comes in terms of the, the the treatment itself and as we mentioned heart is one of the most effective ways to prevent further complications of HIV, which leads to AIDS. And uh, the idea or the principle or the aim of HEART is to reduce morbid mor morbidity and mortality, to uh, suppress viral load, and to uh, reduce plasma levels of the viral into less, um, in into um, undetectable uh, uh, numbers. Uh, and not, not to mention, of course, the other ways of prevention would be the usage of uh, condoms and to avoid basically a high risk behavior. I see. Would, um, does Hafiz and Kai have anything to add on? Uh, yeah, I would like to uh, add on another method actually that we always uh, share with share our, our clients. clients. Uh, we use ABCD method. What is ABCD? It's actually first A is abstinence. Abstinence means that you don't have any sex at all. So, but if you connect, uh, you cannot uh, tahan or everything. You can go to another one is B. So be faithful. Be faithful to your partner. Yeah, stick to only one sexual partner. You should avoid multiple partners. Yes. Uh, and then uh, C 
is condom. So use condom like Dr. Saad said, use latex condoms. And uh, if you want to use lubricant, must bear in your minds, do not use any oil-based lubricants. So for the oil-based lubricant, it will uh, give an effect to the latex, it will more uh, easily pop. So, so the condom will break up, but, but that is a different thing. So yeah. the main thing is that always use condoms. condoms. And another one, D. D is using drugs, like Dr. Saad said. Uh, we got PrEP and we got PEP. So, yeah. yeah. And I want to add one more thing is that we can always um, educate ourselves. We can always uh, give um, sharing session. I mean, like, if I have the knowledge about prevention, HIV and AIDS, mm -hmm. don't keep it to yourself. Always share with your family and friends. Always be open to talk about it and so that people always get to know that they are at high risk because some of them, they might not knowing that they are doing risky behavior. So by advising and always um, giving sharing information, sharing information, there we have the awareness to know more about HIV and AIDS. I see, thank you. Um, it was very, it was very detailed what Dr. Saad mentioned and of course, you know, add on with um, the mnemonics provided by Hafiz and Kai, I think if our audience are watching this, you know, if anybody want to know how to approach and prevent this, I think ABCD method, it's it's very easy, very straightforward. I think it would be very beneficial if people just understand this for um, numbers, uh, sorry, alphabets. So I think we'll come to our last segment, which is the Q&A. Um, right, um, do we have questions? <laughs> sorry. Um, this segment is normally we engage with the public. So um, I'll, I'll guess I'll have to wait, we have to wait for the tech team to pop us a question, right? So the first question is, um, I'll open this to all the panelists. Uh, so feel free to answer whenever. Since you mentioned uh, sex education to be taught in our education system, which is um, currently in Malaysia, how, how it will help tackle HIV, how will sex ed help tackle HIV and AIDS? And how will this be integrated in our system when when um, when we mention when when sex ed is a taboo and it's not discussed in our community? Well, yeah, uh, sex uh, education is uh, is definitely a taboo. Unfortunately, in many um, underdeveloped and even developing uh, countries. Uh, this is due to um, uh, culture, basically, um, tradition, and religion, all of these uh, combined. But uh, the world is changing, and we should also change with it. And one of the ways to do so is by introducing um, sexual education. I think even the name says it, education, that means the main idea here is to educate young adults, especially those who are on the verge of, uh, of becoming teenagers. This is where the, the sexual uh, activity or you know, the, the, um, the, 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 the genitals basically they develop. So uh, we need to instill in them that HIV is an AIDS transmitted through unprotected sexual activity and that it leads to these complications. So acquiring it will be something um, uh, of a problem. So that's, this is why actually we, we want to educate younger generations so that they can avoid, they know better. Because if you know about a certain disease, you will definitely uh, know how to avoid it, how to deal with it. Okay. Or even if you talk about unwanted pregnancies or uh, accidental pregnancies, uh, this is also comes under sexual education. It's not only HIV, uh, HIV, uh, all the other STDs, uh, pregnancies, teenage pregnancies, and so on. So it is definitely uh, vital to introduce that. Now, sexual education, of course, cannot be done randomly. It has to be done, of course, with the supervision of the government. Uh, appointing people who are qualified, certified, and eligible to do uh, so. And there are plenty of actually of experts from both 
the scientific community and the religious uh, community. They can all work together to come up with the, the best possible outcome for the younger generation. Like in our time, when we were students or we won, we, when we were teenagers and young uh, adults, on, honestly, we never even heard of the word sexual education, which is wrong. We only learned it, uh, you know, uh, as we grow up. But uh, now, especially with the with, with the availability of social media, the connectivity, the internet, I mean, the information can be obtained just like that, as easy as a, as a click. That, of course, has created convenience to most of us, but it also has some um, negative effects that uh, there are a lot of information out there in the net. Which one is true? Which one is not? Which are the myths? Which are the, uh, the you know, the facts? This is where sexual education comes. So definitely, we should always encourage it, not only in Malaysia, but throughout the world. Um, more of a half and Kai. Um, since you guys are engaging with the public, um, I'm pretty sure you guys have engaged the actual education system, the healthcare framework. How how do you guys recommend, or what have, what is currently being done to really uh, actively integrate this into the system? Uh, as uh, NGOs, we always do believe if you want to start something, we have to start with family first. So for this uh, sex education, it must be start from our home itself. Because as a parents, actually, we can uh, put our kids uh, which one is uh, better, which one is not. Not let them uh, explore themselves, you know. As nowadays, we are the one exploring ourselves, what is this, what is not. So I think before we want to uh, put sex education in our uh, schools and everything, we must start from our family first. We must start in small groups. Uh, we have to strengthen our foundation so that they have the picture that the sex education is not something about sex, but it's more than that, like Dr. Saad said. Yeah, yeah. So I want to add more, which is I do agree with what Dr. Sat says. So that's why we came up with uh, approaching the clients or high risk community in social media. So we came up with a various platform. We always available on uh, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram to give awareness. And currently, we be launching a YouTube channel that we give a sharing session about. Uh, me about what is HIV to educate people. I mean, it may seem like nothing, but uh, it will, you know, it will be something Evolve, evolving yeah. in the future. So you can always log on to Class Life, Class K L A S S L Y F E, Class Life YouTube channel. So you can always find our uh, interactive videos over there and. We will be happy to uh, receive any comments or feedbacks, especially among young generations. All right, thank you. Um, resonating with what Dr. Saad said just now, you know, since sex education, I mean, um, knowledge can be obtained by the tip of the finger on the internet. Um, I, I mean, this is my personal question. How do, how do we not abuse that, you know, because um, when we explore sex education, um, we we will need to address pornography and stuff. How do we not abuse that? Well, uh, I mean, there are uh, many uh, legitimate websites uh, that actually provide accurate information about uh, HIV and AIDS. You're talking about the World Health Organization. You're talking about Center for Disease uh, Control and, and Prevention. You're talking about the, the official website of the Ministry of Health. Uh, you're talking about, you know, reputable uh, research uh, centers ac across the world. All, all of these centers, uh, they, they, they provide updated and state-of-the-art and accurate, most importantly, accurate information about HIV treatment, prevention, and transmission. Now, how, how not to abuse that? Of course, everything in life uh, can be used and can be abused a anything in life really so sexual education is, is no uh, exception uh, but but again that's why i said it has to be done 
uh, in, in a proper way through government or through uh, uh, NGOs uh, that those who, who, who provide the sexual education uh, seminars, webinars, or forums, they have to be certified uh, or eligible uh, personnel, you know, either academically, they have like academic qualifications, or in terms of, uh, you know, from a social stand or a religious stand. I mean, the government or, or these non-government organizations should choose those who are appropriate. And not only choosing the person, but the right approach you should never uh, educate people about sex and uh, tell them that, yeah, this is, uh, if you do this, you will get punishment or something like that. No, it, it doesn't work like that, really. Uh, you should always have a positive approach. You should always uh, instill that it is a, a, an easily preventable disease, okay? Rather than always focusing on the negatives always focusing on the punishment, uh, always focusing on the stigma and, and, and the, 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 the side effects. Of course, all of these things are there, but uh, the way to approach it should be always very positive so that you will attract more people to believe in your ideas. Sorry, sorry. I see. Thank you, Officer. Um, um, do we have the second question around? All right. Um, should a HIV positive individual still remains properly protected when engaging in sexual intercourse with another person with um, HIV positive? I, I believe we have already addressed this in our myth. Um, doctor, would you like to re, re I mean, would you all like to re elaborate or? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's actually a very valid question because uh, some people say, so what? Uh, I'm already infected. Uh, well, why do I need to bother to, to use a condom? Well, again, it's because even if you are infected with HIV, you don't want a fresh dose of viral load to enter uh, your system. The idea is to suppress uh, the replication of the, of the virus to the minimum. Uh, so wearing a condom, even if you are HIV positive who is having sex with another HIV positive person, will definitely prevent you from getting that uh, viral load, new, uh, uh, I mean, a fresh dose of, of, of viral load. And at the same time, it will also uh, prevent other types of sexually transmitted diseases. And not to mention, it also prevents or control unwanted pregnancies. Because if, if, if that woman knows for sure that she is HIV positive, or if the man knows that he is HIV positive, then planning a child should be uh, taken very seriously. This is what we call family planning, that uh, you should think twice before making this decision because there is a possibility that that child that you are going to deliver might acquire HIV, even if you take the, the, the necessary precautions, but there is a possibility. So yes, to answer the question, definitely condoms are required uh, during sexual intercourse, even if the person is confirmed HIV positive, for sure. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Um, all right, I think does does Hafiz and Kaiwan add on, or would you guys just are comfortable with moving on to the next question? Uh, I do agree with what Dr. Sad said. Um, we should always um, get a proper protection. Protection. Always remember yeah. yourself. Always uh, uh, bend your mind that. Uh, like what they say, your health is more, you, you put first rather than uh, anything. So always, uh, always uh, put protection, condom latex. Yeah. I see. Okay. Um, so the, the third question is, how have HIV, sorry, how have COVID-19 affected people living with HIV and their medications commitment, you know? Um, with labs, you know, if, if such if if such happen with lapsed medication regime, will this increase the risk of transmit? Uh, sorry, increase the risk of transmissibility, and will this be a public concern? Oh, definitely. I mean, <clears throat> uh, COVID nineteen has 
changed or has affected the way we live in so many uh, ways. I mean, 2020 was uh, was one hell of a year, really. Um, so uh, COVID-19 has disrupted um, the movement of people, uh, even for a, a, a simple physical activity like going to buy groceries or whatever, especially in the first uh, few months of the pandemic. Uh, yes, it, it was really bad. I mean, now, of course, life is going um, slowly or gradually going back uh, to the new normal, I would say, not really normal. Uh, but uh, yes, those who are actually uh, infected with HIV, they were the most um, affected people with the COVID-19 pandemic because uh, their access to treatment, you know, they need to, to go to the hospital uh, to get their medication. Unfortunately, those hospitals were packed with COVID-19 patients or they were actually battlefields. Uh, to manage those uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, patients. And you, you guys know that COVID-19 is highly infectious. Uh, so going there to get your HIV medication, you might end up uh, uh, acquiring the novel coronavirus. So you will have actually two uh, viruses instead of one. Uh, and so th this is why it had actually a tremendous uh, impact. And this is why the World Health Organization uh, they are calling for global solidarity and resilience in, in services that even uh, with, um, you know, with all of these restriction movements, with the uh, MCO, the CMCO, uh, there should always be a system, a backup system to ensure that HIV infected individuals, their treatment will not be interrupted by this pandemic, either through, for example, uh, delivery, uh, through post, through mail, or whatever uh, way possible. It's not necessary that the patient has to go to the hospital to get the medication, but rather you deliver it to their doorsteps just to avoid contact and from acquiring uh, COVID-19. So definitely there was a huge impact, but I think people have learned, government uh, and agencies, they have learned. We have learned a lot of lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic, and we continue to learn and to adapt to it. I see. Um, what about from class? And are there people or are there people living with HIV calling you guys up asking about their concerns in this aspect? Uh, definitely, definitely, yeah. There are a few of our clients that have uh, problems in That's getting uh, uh, their medication because you know that there are patients that we've been dealing with living in other state. So due to the Quarantine, the restrict movement order, they cannot pick up the yeah, medication. No, so what we did is that we actually we be the postman. Yeah. We 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 help them to get the medication for them. Yeah. We yeah. settle the medication instead of post we are using postage, right? Yeah. Yeah. So COVID-19 has been tremendously affected among PNHIV. They are a short case, I, I think, in terms of getting appointments to public health facility. Like, for your information, if you want to have an appointment now, you cannot simply just walk away to government health clinic. You must have appointment first. So that's why they came up with online booking, or you can always make a booking through us, us and we will book on behalf of you so that is one of the impact of COVID-19 because you know just like Dr. Saad says that they try as much as possible to reduce the the contact between uh, COVID-19 and infection rates yeah all right thank you um do we have the next question now All right. Um, if clients engage with risky activity, you know, um, what is the safe time frame for them to take post prophylactic medication? I mean, since you're speaking of this post prophylactic, I mean prophylactic medications. Um, let's just talk about pre prophylactics. Um, what is the safe time frame to do it before, and what's safe time to do it after? Uh, 
For pre-exposure prophylaxis, I mean, uh, the recommended time is within uh, 24 to uh, 72 hours. Actually, the earlier, the better. Okay, and that also uh, applies for the post-exposure uh, prophylaxis. So what, what these uh, drugs will do, they will actually suppress, uh, I mean, especially if, if the virus is, is at its initial stage of infection, they will actually suppress the virus from entering inside of the host uh, cell. Uh, once the virus is just floating outside uh, the host cell, uh, the virus actually will be eliminated by the uh, host immune uh, system. So it has been clinically proven that both pre and post uh, exposure prophylaxis, uh, they, they have a really um, uh, I mean, significant uh, reduction in, in, in the infectivity of HIV. So the time frame is basically one to three days latest. After that, following that, uh, the the effectiveness of these drugs will will be reduced definitely. Yeah, the longer it takes, uh, the less effective these uh, drugs will become. Yeah. Plus. Yeah, I want to add more about uh, the pesticide. So maybe some of you guys asking where to get. Perhaps or perhaps. So actually, we do have a site we call as mypreplocator.com. So you can always log on to the website. You can always search your nearby clinic that sells preps right. or perhaps. Or you can simply go to our collaboration clinics such as MUCD Healthcare, which is much more affordable. I, I think um, this is based on our experience. Most of the clients cannot afford to buy PEP because it is expensive. In Malaysia itself, it costs around 800 something, but there are alternative ways, which is PREPs. PREPs is only, you can get less than 100 ringgit, and most people are afford to, uh, to buy it, yeah. Um, let me just add on. I mean, this is my personal question. Um, how frequent can we take pre-exposure prophylaxis or post-exposure prophylaxis? Because we can't be... I, 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 I do not know the answer to, but um, I would just assume that we can't be repetitively taking pre-exposure back-to-back and engage in risky behavior every day, right? So how, how many times can we take at most or how... How much interval time must we give before next dose? Well, I mean, that, that's a good question, actually. It, it all depends on your lifestyle. What are the things that you are doing uh, that actually expose you to, to high-risk behavior? I mean, of course, if you are like a healthcare worker, uh, you can't help it but to be in constant contact with people. Uh, and many, m many of them or some of them, they are actually HIV positive. So... That one, you can help it. But of course, even if you're a healthcare worker, you cannot like take the uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis every single day. That doesn't make sense. Only if you have been uh, exposed to a needle stick injury or like, for example, uh, a high-risk behavior. So, um, uh, of course, if you keep doing high-risk behaviors and taking the pre-exposure uh, uh, or post-exposure prophylaxis frequently, then after a while, um, your system will start to uh, kind of develop resistance actually to it. Uh, and this is the, the, the thing with all drugs that viruses usually with time, this is also one of the problems of antibiotic resistance that uh, bacteria or microorganisms, they will develop eventually resistance to the drugs if they are being misused. Okay, so the key word here is to use it wisely whenever is absolutely necessary. Now, if you are in constant uh, exposure, then you don't have choice but to actually keep using it. But you have to somehow manage your lifestyle just to avoid using it very, very frequently. Um, what about Harvis and Kai? I'm pretty sure you guys have clients coming to me this question also or uh, so uh, based on our experience dealing with clients yes we do agree we have a clients that um, 
not very risky behavior, but they want to take preps. Again, just like Dr. Saad says, it depends on your lifestyle, yes. your sexual lifestyle. If you think that you are low risk, why should you want to take a preps? So we always recommend preps or preps for those Who's that are high highly risk, risk especially um, sex worker. We can have male sex worker or female sex worker. So we always recommend them to uh, get breaks of fat and always be transparent with the, doctor. with the doctors. Yeah, you should not be ashamed to talk about your sexual lifestyle because they are the one that trying to help you. They are trying to uh, prevent you from getting infected. So you should not, you know, lie to your doctors. Yeah, and there's a few cases actually. Yeah, uh, the client we lie because of the. Because they're shamed. Yeah, because they're they are ashamed. They, they think that the to be judged, then no, 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 it's not true. You should be transparent. You should mm. talk about um, how your sexual, sexual life, activity yeah. or sexual life gonna be like because the doctor knows really well how to handle it. Mm. All right, thank you. Do we have uh, do we have more questions? Right. Um can you talk about the family planning aspect of people living with HIV? I think Klaus would have a very great insight in this question. Uh, yeah, probably we want to say that uh, KK Chiras, our associated clinic, have reported that uh, they, are they, uh, they are family uh, who are parents uh, living with HIV, HIV yeah. and then they're having the kids and without any infections. So, uh, what we can say that always be transparent to your doctors, always uh, feel safe to talk about the sexual life, about the family planning itself with your doctors. Uh, Again, just like Dr. Saad says, the most effective medication is heart. So, before you are planning to start a family, you can always uh, begin your treatment. That is the most important thing. Because if you do not start your treatment, so you will get, uh, you will transfer the HIV to your partners. So the first thing is, before you are planning to have a family, you should start your treatment. Mm -hmm. And the same goes to for the Muslim, if you want to get married and everything, you have to start a treatment and you should inform your partner, your future wife or husband that you are living with HIV. And that, that I think that there will be no problem. I, I mean, like, you can have a children that living with free of HIV, so you shouldn't be worried. So the main key is that you should always consult your doctor in terms of family planning. Yeah. So, Dr. Sa, well, let's say if a patient approach you and ask, you know, for your advice, if they want to start a family and they are currently HIV positive, what would you advise them from a medical point of view? Yeah, well, I mean, of course, uh, having a family is the right of every uh, human being, right? And even if that person is uh, HIV positive, there are still ways uh, that we can manage uh, to minimize uh, the damage. Of course, there are many questions uh, that needs to be asked. Uh, this is what we call family planning. For example, um, what is the safest way of delivery? The baby. Okay, and we mentioned that usually is a cesarean section just to avoid direct contact with the vaginal fluid that can be infected with HIV. This is one thing. The other thing that if the partner, if one of the partner is actually on uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, will that lower the chance of transmitting uh, the, the virus into the uh, into the other partner? Uh, yes. I mean, the answer is yes, it can be. Uh, so this is where uh, we can actually recommend pre-exposure or even post-exposure prophylaxis to one of the partners if they are suspected or confirmed to have uh, a, a HIV. Now, uh, what are uh, the, 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 the other um, methods of birth control that uh, best suits uh, the woman, for example, if that woman, she don't want to get pregnant now and she is HIV positive, there are many ways uh, to uh, for birth control. M maybe some of these ways will actually interfere with, with that HIV infection. 
So this is why uh, that woman needs to consult a healthcare provider on which is the best way to actually uh, control uh, pregnancy. The other uh, question that can be uh, asked is whether that treatment will cause damage to the infant during pregnancy. And this is why heart uh, is a collection of more than 25 different types of drugs. So uh, that, that's why we actually, we have the luxury now to choose to mix and match all different types of, uh, of uh, antiretroviral uh, therapy in combination to three or four different types because you know different people they have different reaction to it some they are allergic to some groups others they are not uh, some they have effect on the on, on the uh, pregnancies others they are not and, and 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 so on and the last question that uh should be asked is whether uh usually uh how actually can i avoid uh transmitting uh, hiv uh, during pregnancies or even during deliveries okay this is basically one of the most important uh, questions so during pregnancies of course it can be avoided by regularly taking the treatments and uh, during delivery if also one of the ways is uh, through a c-section or there are other ways of actually uh, delivering uh, uh, the babies so yeah definitely family planning is something very very important and this is also needs to be instilled in the society, in the public. All right, thank you. Um, do we have more questions? All right, I think uh, this question, Dr. Sal will be a very good um, <clears throat> speaker for this. Um, are doctors with HIV positive deemed to be deemed to be fit for practice in the clinical settings, let's say in Malaysia? Well, uh, the answer is, is, is yes. I would say it's really unfair to, uh, to discriminate a medical doctor by just having an illness. Unless that illness, of course, it is highly contagious. For example, you're talking about uh, tuberculosis. Uh, then of course that that healthcare provider will uh, will be a hazard to others, um, or even if that healthcare, for example, is is COVID uh, positive. So definitely, these are highly contagious infectious diseases. But HIV is is one of those infections that again does not transmit through air, through food, through water, or even a simple uh, skin touch. Uh, so uh, no. It is not fair and they should not be uh, deemed unfit for clinical practice. Instead, we should always um, in, in encourage people, whether they are medical doctors or not, that HIV is just a chronic disease and agencies and governments should, should treat uh, those medical professionals who are HIV positive with the same level of care uh, than those who are not uh, infected. Uh, as I told you, if, especially if that medical doctor is not a surgeon, is not involved in invasive procedures or direct contact with blood, then uh, I, I don't see any harm of, 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 not, of just keeping the doctor actually serving the community. Uh, as long as that doctor is monitoring his or her viral load regularly and taking the drugs on regular basis, then um, uh, he or she are absolutely fit for medical practice. Uh, I see. All right. Um, what about um, class? I, I, I'm not sure if you can, if you, if, if this question is relevant to you, but um, do you have anything at all, if, or, or we can just move to the next question? Yeah, I do agree with uh, Dr. Saatse, but we, unfortunately, uh, in Malaysia, if the doctor or practicing medical have a HIV, they cannot become a doctor. So, so what they did is that um, people that are studying medical, yeah. they, they, they really love, you know, studying in healthcare settings. So that's why they get involved in NGOs and all that kind of thing. So, so I do agree. 
this kind of discrimination towards them uh, should must be stopped. Yeah. Let's see. Um, do we have next question? Yes, no. <laughs> Okay, I don't think we have any more questions. All right. Um, okay, I think um, I'll just close it here. Um, thank you so much. Um, there's no hope this session, this uh, forum discussion is beneficial to the public because, you know, we have like Dr. Saad, who is a, um, a clinical microbiologist. And then we also have our NGOs here class. We have Hafiz and Kai. Um, on behalf of Masa Metzok, I really appreciate you guys for you know, accepting the invitation to be the panelists for this event. Um, right, uh, I will let them for this following slide. Go ahead, please, please. <laughs> go, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. So before we end our session today, so thank you for listening to today's topic. Yeah. So please uh, let together against prevention of HIV and AIDS, but you can also simply donate to us either to online, check or cash. You can always uh, find this information from our website, which is plus.org.my. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so I'll just finish it. Um, I genuinely appreciate all the stakeholders. You know, like I mentioned, um, we have Dr. Saad, Pate, Kai, um, we have Masa University, and also Class for being part of this forum. And then um, I hope this session will actually educate the medical fraternity and also the public in understanding HIV and AIDS, in hopefully um, debunking the myths and then reducing the possible discrimination and raising awareness about this. So. If you're listening, uh, if you're watching this out there, um, public, uh, our audience, I really appreciate you for tuning in to the end. And I think there will be a feedback form being circulated around. It will be great for you to, uh, once again, it will be great for you to fill that up for us, for our own evaluation. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Hafiz. And thank you, Kai. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. So just last word before we go that, uh, in conjunction with the World uh, AIDS Day 2020, we all play a role uh, to ensure better HIV services to everyone across the globe towards global solidarity and resilient services. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, doctor.